Now let me, let me tell you what's going on here. Uh, we're in a divided kingdom. So you got the northern and the southern kingdom, Israel and Judah. Right now here in chapter 22, we're doing a history of, this, of, of, of Judah. And it's not very good at this point. Uh, we've had a series of bad kings. Manasseh, long-term reign, bad. His son Amon comes along behind him. Like father, like son, bad. But good news, as we come to chapter 22 of 2 Kings, young eight-year-old Josiah has taken the throne. And he's good. The Bible says that Josiah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Now as we get to 2 Kings 22, uh, Josiah has been on the, uh, the throne and now he's decided to have a renovation down at the church house. It's church cleanup day down at the church. Okay? So they put some money, they've got some money set aside he sent Hilkiah down there, the high priest, and it's cleanup day at the church. That's where we're at, 2 Kings 22, and we're fixing to have a revival. And I believe that we'll see in these verses tonight, I believe there's about four things that happen that are going to have to happen this week if we're going to have a revival. I know we've got services scheduled, but how many know that we need to hear from heaven? Amen. And so if that's going to happen, I believe the same thing that happened here will have to happen uh, this week. 2 Kings 22 and verse 8, it's church cleanup day. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Time out. Are you following along here? They have made a discovery down at the church house and what have they found? They found the Bible. You getting this? They found the Bible. Reckon what they're doing down at the church house before they found the Bible. Reckon maybe this is the reason the country is in the mess that it has been all these years of godless leadership because they're not even using the Bible down at the church. Lost in the church house. I have found the book of the law. First step to revival, here I see they found the Bible. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. They found it. Now what did they do? They read it. Can I make a prediction here in this story? Business is fixing to pick up in this deal. Found the Word of God. They read the Word of God. And it came to pass, verse 11, when the king had, what's the next word? Heard. Found it. Read it. Listened to it. I'm talking about really listened to it. I mean they really listened. He listened intently to the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. That's a sign of mourning and deep distress. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam the son of Shaphan and Achbor the son of Micaiah and Shaphan the scribe and Asaiah servant of the king saying, Go ye, inquire the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that which is, which is written concerning us. Shaphan's down there. They're having church cleanup day. In the cleanup, buried under a bunch of stuff, they find the law of God, the words of God. They bring it. They read it in front of the king. The king hears it. And then, number four, step to revival, he acts on what he heard. He said, we got to do something because this is bad because we're in big trouble. 
he calls a national day of mourning, a national day of prayer, and Judah has a nationwide revival. But what I want you to notice for the sake of this message tonight is none of it would have happened had not somebody unearthed the greatest treasure that's ever been given, the Word of God. Buried, neglected, forgotten, maybe despised or ridiculed, but still just as powerful as it ever was. All it took was for somebody to find it, dust it off, open its pages, read it, and act on the words therein. Every preacher here knows that sermons come in various places and in various ways. But it is highly unusual that I can tell you tonight exactly where I was and what I was doing. I remember it like it was yesterday. But I can tell you exactly where I was when God gave me what I'm about to give you. It was Monday morning, September the 8th. 2008, almost 11 years ago. I can tell you where I was at. I was in the parking lot of Hardy's Restaurant. Y'all know Hardy's, right? We've got Hardy's down here. And uh, I'm a creature of habit. As a pastor, I was a creature of habit. You could set your clock by my daily rituals. And on a Monday after Sunday, I would have went and drove my car normally to McDonald's. Now you say, why if you normally went to McDonald's? i tell you how often I went to McDonald's. True story, I've been gone from Ohio five years, went back two months ago, pulled to the same McDonald's drive through and the manager came and said, hey, Reverend, long time no see. True story. I would get a sausage biscuit and I would get to USA Today and I'd sit in my car and read that and go on my way. Now, you say, but you said you were at McHardy's. That's because I had been to the doctor, and the doctor said I needed to consider making some lifestyle changes, so I decided to quit going to McDonald's and go to Hardy's. <laughs> True story. I am eating my sausage biscuit, minding my own business. I'm not thinking anything spiritual. And I am reading the USA Today. I am just about ready. I've dispensed with the biscuit. I am just about ready to close the paper. And if you know anything about the USA Today, the USA Today is America's newspaper. And in the main section of the paper, there are 50 blurbs on one page every day, 50 little blurbs of a news item representing from every state in the United States of America. And I'm just, John, you're like this. I'm just getting ready to shut the paper and my eye caught, my attention was caught, Charlestown, West Virginia. Not Charleston, the capital of West Virginia, but Charlestown, West Virginia. That was the date line. And uh, I said, let me, uh, let me look here and see what's going on back in West Virginia. And this is what I read. USA Today, Monday, September 8th. Construction worker found a live 10-pound Confederate artillery round inside the wall of a home here. American Public University System, which recently bought the home, gave the round to the Jefferson County Museum, which plans to disarm it. Are you paying attention? Are you following? Said American Public Facilities Director Joseph Schlecky. Now, when I, got, I was so fascinated with this, and I really got to studying this. When I got home, I saw, I found an article uh, later as I was studying for this and got onto this that came out then five days later, the Charleston Daily Mail, Saturday, September 13th. Additional information. It said Jefferson County Historical Society board member Jim Glimp says the shell likely hit the house and stuck during a fight October 18, 1863, when Confederate General John N. Bowden's artillery fired on the Jefferson County Courthouse. Ladies and gentlemen, what that means, what I have just read to you, 
is that 142 years after it had been fired, a live round, in other words, it could have exploded at any time in the wall of the house, was taken out and disarmed. I had several thoughts. I don't know what you're thinking. I thought to myself, how would you like to be some of the folks that had spent the night in that house? And how would you have slept the next night knowing and realizing that there was a cannonball in the wall of your house that could have exploded any time? But what amazed me was 142, the Civil War ended 1865. It had been fired in 1863. At this time, 145 years had passed, and yet it still had the potential of going off at any time. This so fascinated me that I made it, I mean, I really got obsessed with the topic. And would it surprise you? It may not surprise some of you since you live in the South and there are battlefields here, but would it surprise you that is not an isolated incident? Would it surprise you to know that there are thousands of unexploded ordinances in the ground all around us? I'm talking about us down here, all across this country. If I were to ask you this question, who was the last casualty of the Civil War? Who would you say? Some people would say it was Abraham Lincoln because he was killed because of the war after the war had officially ended. Some would say it's Lieutenant Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain from Maine who went on to become the governor of Maine who was wounded at Petersburg but did not die from his injuries until 1914. But I'd like to show you tonight the last casualty of the Civil War. You say, how can that be the last casualty of the Civil War? That's a color picture. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Sam White. And as I went home and studied this, now please, I'm on the air, I'm, I promise you, I'm, I'm on the runway, but we're going to take off here in a minute. This is all going somewhere, all right? Sam White, the Richmond Times Gazette, the headline of the paper in 2008 was the last casualty of the Civil War. Sam White was a Civil War collector. He loved to collect artifacts from the Civil War. One of the things he loved to collect was ordnance, cannonballs. And one day in Richmond, Virginia, Sam White had 18 cannonballs lined up in his driveway. It's a, it's a nice day, and he is restoring those. He's sanding them. He's uh, getting the dust and the dirt and the rust off. And in his driveway while he is working on a particular cannonball. It exploded, killing him instantly and sending shrapnel into the door of a house a quarter of a mile away. Last casualty of the Civil War. It was unexploded ordnance. And then I began to look, and then I began to Google. July 1922, Waterton, New York. There are eight boys between the ages of 11 and 16. They are playing croquet. Anybody remember croquet? Kids probably don't know what croquet is. Croquet was, you have a mallet, and you have these little, look like almost pool balls, and you put the ball out there, and you hit them through little mesh things. Eight boys playing croquet in the backyard in Waterton, New York. They don't have, they need, a, they need another, another ball. And so they go in and get grandpa's uh, little mini ball from World War I. It's been on display in the house, sitting up on the porch. One of the boys took a big crack at it. And it was a scene of carnage, they said, had never been seen by the likes of the rescuers that came, all eight boys scattered, lost their lives on the lawn. 
Ventura, California, 2006, a teacher had a 40 millimeter shell that he used as a paperweight in his classroom. His dad had brought back from World War II and in class in front of 20 horrified onlookers. This might not be the best stories for the kids here. This is the last one. And he went to kill a fly, picked it up, dropped it down. And he lost his right arm. Unexploded ordinance. You think about 150 years gone by. All of the players of the Civil War are dead and gone. You wonder why people don't take those things more seriously. Could it be because of its relic status? Could it be because that they've been in the ground so long? Could it be because, I mean, you think of cannonballs, good grief, it's so old-fashioned. I mean, you think of the the weaponry we have today. I mean, some of our Navy guys can sit out on a computer in the Mediterranean and go beep, boop, boop, and put their coordinates in and send a bomb hundreds of miles away down somebody's chimney. You think about an old cannonball, rusty, and dirty. I still wasn't thinking anything spiritual, but I folded my paper put my biscuit wrapper in the trash and I distinctly remember saying to myself, well, just goes to show you, just because something's buried doesn't mean it's dead. Just because it's buried doesn't mean it's dead. And boy, that began to eat at me that day and here's the thing, and again, I still wasn't thinking spiritual. Here's the first thing that I thought. I thought that we live in a country that really is obsessed with youth. You know that? Do you know how many billions of dollars we spend trying to at least give the appearance that we're still young? I mean, millions of dollars that people use to nip and tuck and pull and, uh, you know, straighten out and iron out the, the wrinkles to give the impression that we're still right. There is such an obsession with youth and there's such a negativity and a connotation with the elderly. But I'm telling you, the senior citizens of this country not only deserve a special place of honor, but they deserve our respect and they deserve to be listened to. And the younger generation could learn a thing or two from our older generation. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Oh, listen. I, listen, there, there's somebody wrote something and I think it's very appropriate said senior citizens are constantly being criticized for every conceivable deficiency of the modern world, real or imaginary. We know or take responsibility for all we've done and do not blame others. But on reflection, we'd like to point out that it's not senior citizens who took the melody out of music. Listen, I guarantee you, if you are somewhere in Nashville this week and you come up to a car, the windows are tinted and the whole car is shaking, boom, chicka, boom, chicka, boom, chicka, boom. I guarantee you, look over, it's probably not going to be a senior citizen. <laughs> and they may be listening to this stuff. They may be listening to these, where this guy, is, they're talking. They're just talking. They talk fast. They talk and run. Hey, that may be neat, but that's not music. That's just a guy talking fast. But I tell you, there's a generation across this building that remember songs that had lyrics that you could understand. Can I get an amen? amen? Oh, yeah, there's a generation in here that knows songs you grew up on. I'm talking about secular songs that, re that made sense, that told a story. Songs like The Witch Doctor. You remember that one? Remember the lyrics to that? Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah. Ting, tang. Bunch of heathens, you've got that's exactly. I've exposed it. Was well, the senior citizens took the pride out of appearance. Again, you go walking down the street, you see somebody, pants on the ground, pants on the ground, looking like a fool with the pants on the ground. Guarantee it's not a senior citizen. The courtesy out of driving, the romance out of love, the commitment out of marriage, the togetherness out of family, the learning out of education, God out of government and school. Thank God for our old generation. 
And I tell you, that attitude has, has creeped into the church. There is a danger in the church, and this is really has nothing to do with anything, but let me just put this in. There, is a, there are two dangers. There is one danger that a lot of our churches have. They're dying because they don't, uh, they don't try to reach young people at all. They don't have any young people, and the church literally is just, it's just in a matter of years it's going to be gone because there's no outlook for the future. So that's one danger. And then the other danger is we're only going for young people and you, we're going to kick the senior citizens to the curb. And can I tell you that is a danger and that is wrong and I believe there are going to be a lot of churches that are going to have a lot to answer for on the day of judgment. I'm talking about people I'm, that have paid the bills and taught the classes and, and they're, all they're looking for is a song every once in a while that they recognize. And I can tell you, listen, there is, I, I thought about this today. There is no church. It would be very tempting for this church to do that. Do you know why? Because you got a pastor that is so cool. I mean, he could, he could wear the skinny jeans and get up here and, you know, take the pulpit out. And I mean, he, could, he, just, he just oozes coolness. I mean, look at him up here this morning. I mean, I'm looking. I mean, I, mean, I hate him sometimes. I mean, just be honest. He looked like he just came out of a GQ magazine. I mean, it's sickening. I'm telling you, somebody says, why don't you wear, why I don't wear skinny jeans? Because if I put skinny jeans on, they'd look like a blood pressure cuff that's gun constricted on somebody. <laughs> but listen, thank God for a church that has balance. You do think, and listen, let's be honest. Part of that balance is having me to do morning services because that's going to be more, more, more older folks are going to be there. That, and and I, I think it's great to be able to honor. And, and to, what I'm saying is this world sometimes does not put a high priority on our senior citizens. And I think that we ought to honor them. I think we ought to do that uh, in life and I think we ought to do it in the church. Somebody said, hooray for senior citizens. They're the life of the party, just as long as it doesn't last past 8 p.m. <laughs> Somebody said, I can't, I'm smiling because I can't hear anything you're saying, but praise the Lord for senior citizens. But I began to think spiritually. Hey, first of all, tonight, just because the scriptures are buried doesn't mean they're dead. That's what they had here in this passage. The, the Bible had been buried in the church house. What were they doing? What kind of services were they having without the law of God? And yet they said, look at what we have found. They had them put to the somewhere. Somebody along the way had put it on the shelf of irrelevance. And can I tell you, there are a lot of folks that have put the Bible, there are a lot in the liberal crowd out in this world who say the Bible is irrelevant. And I'm telling you, that's sneaking over into the church world too. And we're almost to the, like, we're so desperate that we'll do anything and say anything and be anything because the Bible's not going to get it done. Look up here, I'm easy to spot. I still believe the Word of God will get the job done. And that's what I say, what a blessing this morning that we heard the choir sing the gospel in song and then you had a preacher that got up and he took the Bible and he read a Bible story and beautifully took us to the cross. And I tell you, listen, there's a lot of plans that this world has, but nothing will be. God has a plan A, he does not have a plan B, and his plan is the man of God under the hand of God, in the stand of God, preaching the plan of God to a lost and a dying world. Just because you've got the scriptures up on the shelf does not mean they're dead. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is quick and it is powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. People send me, th they, they, they send me things to get my blood pressure up but just because when I talk about things like this, 
but I'm telling you, it's plumb pitiful. Some instances and some things. I, somebody sent me something about, we're going to put the Bible up for the next two uh, months. We're going to do a series on Dr. Seuss books. Now, can't you just hear somebody's testimony in 30 years? Praise the Lord. I got saved on Cat in the Hat. Bless God, I walked the aisle. I mean, come on. And then there was this guy, this joker, summer, he, was, he was doing a summer cinema series. He was doing, he was, his messages were on the, the number top 10 box office hits of the week. And when I say this, this guy was a joker, I'm not being, disparaging him. He actually was in the pulpit dressed as the joker from Batman. The word of God is quick and it is powerful. I'm not ashamed, Romans 1, 16, of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And you know, you've heard that that word power in the Greek is the Greek word dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. Listen, the word of God is powerful. It is just as powerful it, as ever has been because God does not change. I'm telling you, when we take the gospel and we share the gospel, there is power in that and it is explosive. And you'll know it. It's like that guy that got saved. He said, how do I know I'm saved? And the old preacher told him, he said, it's just like a guy sitting in the chair. Somebody rolled something under it. He said, is that a firecracker or a stick of dynamite? He said, bless God, when it goes off, you'll be the first to know. The Word of God is powerful. Just because the Scriptures are buried doesn't mean they're dead. Thank God for churches and Bible-believing Christians that believe in sticking with the Word of God. Hey, just because the Spirit's buried doesn't mean He's dead. Notice I said He, and I said He with a capital H. You do realize it's not an it we're talking about. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. He. Aren't you thankful for the Holy Spirit? His work. The Holy Spirit is a key ingredient in anything we do. All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. In our singing, in our preaching, in our worship, the key ingredient is the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts us. That's, if you're saved tonight, that's how you got saved because the Holy Spirit convicted you that you were lost and you didn't need a Savior. I had a fellow years ago in our church, Tim Porterfield, and uh, he was coming. His son had gotten saved. And he was coming and he, came, he asked me to talk to me after service one day and his tears streaming down his face. He said, Preacher, I just got to ask you something. He said, Why is it that when you get up there and talk, it's like you're speaking right to me? I was able to tell him, I said, Tim, that's not me talking. That's not the voice you're hearing. You're hearing another voice, the voice of the Holy Spirit. And then Tim, several weeks later, got saved. And then uh, sometime later, he was on a trip with our Pioneer Club kids to the Creation Museum. And they said he was sitting in Wendy's at lunch, tears again streaming down his face. And somebody said, what's wrong, Tim? He said, I... I just think and I've waited until I was 40 years old. I could have had all this enjoyment and the fellowship and the love. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. The Holy Spirit convict. And then, yes, of course, we know that the, the Holy Spirit is the comfort. Aren't you thankful for the comfort that only the Holy Spirit can bring? The Lord knows I'm not uh, the sharpest knife in the drawer, and I often need word visuals. I need visuals to help me. With, the, with how God works in our life. And many, many years ago in our church, <clears throat> there was a couple, uh, the, the husband, uh, he sang in the quartet there uh, that, that I sang in for, for 25 years. And uh, he and his wife, John, and his wife, Jessica, they were uh, found that they were expecting their first child. And it was a crisis pregnancy from the very beginning. And they had Jessica on bed rest from a very early time. But... Uh, despite all of their best prevention and efforts, Jessica went into labor several months prematurely. I'll never forget the morning 
there at our little country, you know, county seat there in the, the little hospital there. And they came out and gave the announcement that the baby had been born. Grace was born just right at, uh, just under, I think, two pounds. And, of course, there was a team already on site from the Akron Children's Hospital that was getting ready to, it was a very critical, it was a very touch-and-go uh, situation. And they, they invited say that I could go in and have a word of prayer quickly while they were getting everything ready. They were getting ready to transport uh, Gracie to, the, to Akron. And, uh, of course, it was, it was a very sad and a touching sight because every parent wants to hug, uh, you know, hold their child. And, 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 and they wheeled the, uh, the, the baby, was in an incubator. And, of course, Jessica, they're looking at the baby, but they can't touch the baby and everything, wires and everything. And I'm trying to pray, and I kind of choked out a few words and then I, they were busy and working quickly and so I backed off into the corner and sat in the corner and watched as they continued to work. All of a sudden as they're getting ready to wheel the baby out, I notice a nurse goes over and she has a package and she's at the, the bedside talking to Jessica. Well, I was nosy because I want to know what was going on here. I didn't, and, and she's unwrapping what just looks to me as a, as a look like a, a blanket or a comforter and, and she's talking and giving instructions to Jessica. So I'm listening. And the, the nurse said to her, said, this was one of the nurses from Children's Hospital, said, now, Jessica, what this is, is a snoodle. And it looks like a blanket to me. What in the world is a snoodle? Said, what this is, is we give this at times when mother and child are separated at birth. There's a bonding time that you're not going to be able to have because we have to take Gracie up and get her more care. But even though you can't be with your baby, there is a way, bless God, there is a way that you can still have your presence with your child. What we're going to do, we're going to ask you to take this blanket. We're going to ask you to put it underneath your gown and put it right up next to your skin for the next several hours during the day today so that your presence, that your scent can cover and just envelop this blanket. And then we're coming back tonight and we're going to get this snoodle and we're going to take it to Akron and we're going to put it in the incubator with Gracie and so that even though you can't be there during these critical moments, your presence, you can still bond with your baby because your presence will be with her. And I'm sitting there and I'm in the corner rocking back and forth and I'm about ready to have a Baptocostal spell. I was thinking to myself, dear Lord, 2,000 years ago, Jesus in an upper room said, boys, I'm fixing to go away, but I'm not going to leave you alone. Thank God he left the presence of God with us in the form of the precious Holy Spirit. I couldn't take any more. I came up there, I said to the nurse, Bless God, I've got my own snoodle. Thank God for the Holy Spirit and His presence. If you've ever walked through a valley and if you've ever gotten to the point where you realize that God is all that you have, that is when and only when you'll realize that He is all that you need. And He'll come, I guarantee you, in the midnight hour in the form of the precious Holy Spirit. Hey, this world despises. This world would mock what I'm saying. This world says you need lights and gizmos and gadgets. But I'm telling you the greatest need we have in our churches and in our lives is to get connected back to heaven's 220 line. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And just because we've relegated, mocked it, and put it aside doesn't mean he's dead. He's just as powerful. I know that there's been testimonies, and you can attest all across this building, to his power in your life. Just because the Spirit's buried doesn't mean he's dead. Hey, I'd get run out of town tonight trying to preach this sermon if I didn't go to this one on Easter. Just because a Savior's buried doesn't mean he's dead. Y'all remember this, by the way, too, don't you? When I do that, that means I've made a particularly good point that you need to amen. If you do not amen, I will run down and amen myself if I have to do that five or six times. Look at me, I'm out of shape, and this sermon could take about three hours. Okay, you pick up fast. Revelation 1.18. I am he that liveth and was dead. By the way, this is in red. It's in red, in Revelation. 
Jesus talking, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. The old preacher said, why, tell me why, would you put a stone in front of the tomb of a dead man lest you be afraid the dead man ain't going to stay dead. I'm glad the dead man didn't stay dead, amen. And that has great, great effect on us tonight. Jeff sang about it tonight. Because he lives. He's the first fruits. The first fruits. He's the first one that conquered death. But because he lives, we too can live also. The first fruits of the resurrection. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. This may not mean much to you tonight. But I guarantee you, if you've ever made that walk out to a plot of land and said goodbye to someone precious to you that died in the Lord, it'll mean a whole lot to you. Because the Savior lives. Praise God tonight, just because the saints are buried doesn't mean they're dead. So that changes everything, doesn't it? Those that die in the Lord, that burial plot is nothing but a piece of resurrection ground. And because he lives, those that die in the Lord, that casket is nothing more than a hope chest. And we are those that believe you believe this. I know you believe it because you're here on Easter Sunday night. Had every reason, could have stayed home. You're here. I know you believe it. I just wanted to come by at the beginning of this revival on this Easter night to tell you that we live in a world where Jesus doesn't mean much to this world. I'm thankful that I'm part of a crowd that lift our hands and say, Lord, you don't mean much to this world, but we want you to know you mean the world to us. Mocked, scorned, ridiculed, denied, questioned, criticized, and dismissed. But I'm telling you, I believe with all of my heart, it's just as real. The truth of what I have shared tonight is just as real as the day thousands of years ago that Hilkiah and Shaphan were standing in the temple looking at an old book. Good grief, what is this thing? Probably no account. <sighs> Found the law of God. Took it to the king. Opened it up read it, the king heard it, the king was convicted, he decided to act on the words, he called the nation to repentance, and revival broke out, and what Judah found was just because it's buried doesn't mean it's dead. And tonight we have a hope. If you're here and you're struggling, if you're going through a trial in your life, I'm thankful that I can introduce you and, and reintroduce you to the precious Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you that God did not save you to leave you alone. He will walk with you through your greatest trial. He's here tonight to comfort, console, and help you through whatever you're going through. And if you are here and you are struggling and you've said goodbye to a loved one, may we take heart and be encouraged. 
for the saint of God, it's never goodbye. It's just I'll see you on the other side. If I had hope in this life, I'd be of all men most miserable. Because I've checked, and it's not something we like to talk about at parties, but the mortality rate is one per person. None of us are getting out of here alive. And I am thankful that we have a hope that goes beyond this world and the grave. And if anything Easter reminds us of today is just because something's buried does not necessarily mean it's dead.